First, I wanted to thank a few sponsors for the event tonight that helped us get the, uh, the word out. Uh, we had the U.S. Naval Academy Alumni Association chapter, uh, Association Kansas City chapter, the West Point Society of Greater Kansas City, the West Point Parents Club of Greater Kansas City, and the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. So thanks to all those folks, and I've seen a few faces here, talked to some of you, so thank you very much for coming. Tonight marks the return of one of my favorite library speakers, uh, Randy Roberts. It was about a year ago today that uh, Randy was in town to discuss his biography of Joe Lewis. And being both a fan of sports and history, I found myself really impressed with how he was able to take this uh, tremendous sports figure and tell a much bigger story. But that's kind of what Randy does. Uh, in his words, I look at sports as a way to think about history. It's not just sports for sports sake. I always hope to have something bigger to say. And now he's done it again. His latest book is called A Team for America, the Army-Navy game that rallied a nation. Now I'm gonna assume we have some, uh, some veterans here tonight. Do we have anybody representing the Army here? Uh, and anybody representing the Navy? Uh, uh, my dad was in the Navy, and uh, you all have kind of had your way here the last few years with this series. But spoiler alert, you're not gonna like the way the book ends. A distinguished professor of history at Purdue University, one of, one of the classes Randy teaches is a course on World War II. When he noticed that Army had won a national championship in 1944, he started thinking, how exactly does that happen in the middle of World War II? There's gotta be a story there, right? Turns out there is, a pretty good one. Uh, the book is available for sale outside, courtesy of our friends at Barnes & Noble. Feel free to uh, pick one up after the program if you were so inclined. But right now, to tell you a little bit more about it, please welcome Randy Roberts. I thought, I wanted to show you a clip from a movie, okay? And I, I was going to put it in towards the end, but the technology isn't exactly right. So let me start by, let's get in a mood. Let's, let's go back to 1944. And I want to show you a clip from a movie that happened to be the movie out uh, that, that everybody was going to uh, during the Army-Navy game and in, in the month before the Army-Navy game. So let's start with that movie. Maybe some of you will remember it, and I, I want to come back to it later. So keep it in the back of your mind, okay? You know, just keep it back there, and then, and then I'll pull it back out. your heart be light. Next year all our troubles will be out of sight. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Make the Yuletide gay. Next year all our troubles will be miles away. Once again, as in olden days, happy golden days of your Is that nice? Is that a good way to start? 
You know? Next year, it's going to be better. Okay? Next year, those friends that are gone, they're going to be with us. Next year, if the fates allow. Does she really believe it? I don't know. I don't know. Until then, we'll have to muddle through somehow. I love that line. You know, that's that, that classic line from Great Britain. You know, we'll, we'll just muddle through it, okay? I mean, this is, it's, it's from Meet Me in St. Louis. It's, it's a song, a movie that's about right before the 1904 uh, St. Louis World's Fair. It has nothing to do with World War II, and it has everything to do with World War II. Um, it's, you know, the, the poor little girl, the, the family has is, is, is been disrupted and they're going to move for a better job to New York. The father's going to New York and nobody wants to leave St. Louis. And the poor little girl is worried about how will Santa know where to find us next year? Let's keep it in the back of our mind, okay? So let's keep that back there. But, but this is the time I'm talking about, November. December 1944, when the war seems to be this close to being over, but it's not that close to being over. This is kind of the atmosphere that I'm going to talk about today, and, and the game that I'm going to talk about, and the world I'm going to talk about. You know, why did I do this book? I wanted to write a World War II story. I teach my classes about World War II. I, it, it's I have a lecture group, you know, sometimes it's 500 students in the class. It's my favorite class. I now do it every semester. And I wanted to write something about it. I wanted, though, to write about the home front. I wanted to write the battle front. Okay, something that, you know, that, that like Americans experienced World War II. That it wasn't just all pins on the map. It was what was going home at, or what was going on at home as well. Okay, so with that, background. Let me start. It's the book. Uh, it's, it's a plug for the book. Uh, Team for America. And sometimes I like to start by talking about what history is. Okay. I get a lot of students at Purdue University and they think history looks a little like this. Okay. It is a straight line. It's a road. You know, it's we are here, back there, someplace back there, and the future is straight ahead. It's just a straight line. And this is the way history is. It's this happened, then this happened, then this happened, and this happened, and it couldn't happen any other way. Okay, that's just the way it is. There is a progress of inevitability about history. And I try to say, that this isn't really what history looks like, okay? What history really looks like is something like this, okay? And, and it's, it's confusing. It's one of these overleaf, under, over bypasses. Where, have, have any, are there any of these in Kansas City? I don't know. Are there any? Hey, you know, have you ever driven on one of these things and, and, and you make the wrong turn? And then you say, oh, okay, okay, okay. It, well, if I turn here, then I'll be able to go back around and get on and, and, and go the way I want. And you turn here, and suddenly there isn't a way back on. And before you know it, you're in, what, Joplin, Missouri or something like that, okay? I mean, you're, you're nowhere close. This is the way history is, okay? History isn't a progress of inevitability. Okay, history is confusing, it's full of contingency, it's full of, of the path not taken, and it, is, it only looks clear when we're looking back this way. It's not so clear when we're looking this way, as, as we all know. Okay, sometimes, you know, I, I talk a lot about choices, and one of the things I like to talk about in World War II is command decisions, okay? You know, how do people make decisions? What decisions are good? What decisions are bad? What goes into this decision-making process? Because one of the things I want students to take away from history is it's not just facts. It's not just the greatest story in the world, but it's something you can reflect on and you can use to make decisions yourself, okay? How do you make good decisions? You look at good and bad decisions made in the past. And unfortunately, sometimes the decisions come down to it's impossible to make. You know, I, I, I talk about, in my course, a lot about, some about D-Day, 
okay? And, and the great decision that Eisenhower had to make on, on going in on D-Day when the weather was just absolutely terrible and, and, and it would have had, had the rain and the bad weather continued, it would have doomed D-Day. But, but he had to make a decision. Okay, nobody was going to make the decision for him, and he had some information, and I won't go into this, that the weather was going to get, but he makes his decision, and sometimes it's just flipping a coin, okay? So that's kind of a, the way I look at history, and one of the things I wanted to look at with Army is how did Army develop a national championship in 1944? There's nothing inevitable about it. As a matter of fact, it's, it's, it's a bizarre story. It shouldn't have happened. How does it happen? You know, we have some, and I just talked to a few, we have a few, uh, uh, more than a few, uh, graduate of West Point in here, and, and, and West Point is undergoing, we hope, or people from West Point hope, the Navy people don't hope it quite as much, maybe a renaissance in the program, okay, at West Point. West Point has lost to Navy now, what is it? Uh, Navy people, uh, three years in a row? Is it three years in a row? Uh, yeah, okay, we won't, we won't go how many years, but it's double figures. Anyway, okay, let me start by talking about this guy. Okay, this is a general, Brigadier General, Robert Eichelberger. Okay, Eichelberger had been recently promoted to general, okay, uh, along with, he actually received the letter when he was promoted general. He received the letter from another general who had just been, who had no, another uh, person who had just been uh, promoted up to general, and, and, and the letter said, thank goodness the Army had, had the intelligence to promote the two most outstanding people in the service to generals. Who do you think wrote that letter to him? Who would have been a, a, a appointed general at the same time as Eichelberger? Who would have written a letter that went something like that? Patton, Patton. exactly right, that's who wrote it. It was, it was Patton that wrote, wrote the letter at that time. Uh, so Eichelberger, you know, it's 1940, things are happening. People in the, in the service, they're, they're moving here, they're moving there, I mean, it's clear that there is a war on the horizon. You know, Eichelberger received orders to go here, and then he received orders to go here, and then he, I mean, he, there was, it was like every other day he was receiving another set of orders. And finally he receives a set of orders that said, you are the new superintendent of West Point. Okay, proceed with haste to the academy and assume your position. Okay, so Eichelberger's going to West Point. And on the way to West Point, he decides, well, why not stop in Philadelphia to see the annual classic, the annual classic between Army and Navy. So he goes to the Army-Navy game in Philadelphia, and he watches, and he's really delighted with the enthusiasm of the Corps. They're standing, they're cheering, they're, they're enthusiastic. They're showing the spirit, the esprit de corps that he hoped the Corps has. That's a good point. The bad point is Army is drilled. I think the score is, and I have it up here, I think it's 44 to nothing. Um, it's not a good game for Army. Let me make sure, 48 to nothing. See, I'm trying to make Army look better. Um, 48 to nothing that caps an absolutely dismal season for Army. Army in 1948 went one something, one, seven, and one. Nine games, seven losses, one victory against a really bad opponent, like Williams or something like that, okay, and one tie, okay. It's not, it's not a good game, and, and, and if there's any Williams people in here, I don't, I don't mean to offend Williams people. It's not good, okay? Eichelberger is he's, he's flabbergasted. He's an Army fan. He had, he's a graduate of Army. They've got to do better. He gets to the academy, and one of the first things he does at the academy is get together the academic board, and he says, look, we can't have this. We cannot have the United States Army, West Point, represented by 
losers, okay? I mean, quite frankly, he said, there's a war coming, okay? It, it's going to mean something to the people in uniform that the West Point, Point football team is something they can be proud of, that it's something that's going to be good, okay? That it's something that's going to show cadets how to win, not how to lose gracefully. He's concerned, and he, and he says it, he says, look, you know, by the gods, that was his favorite expression, by the gods, there is a war coming, and in war, you don't get, if you lose one day, you may not get a chance to play the next week, okay? We have got to do something about this. Okay, what do we have here, okay? This is a perfect example of how decisions are made, okay? Somebody has to make a decision to get better. Okay? It has to be a conscious decision. It has to, there has to be purpose involved in it. Eichelberger makes the decision. Without Eichelberger, the story that I'm going to tell wouldn't have happened. Okay? Because there was resistance in the academy to what Eichelberger wants. And primarily what Eichelberger wants is to change the way West Point does business. Okay? Before Eichelberger, the way West Point did business on the football field is they used active duty coaches. Okay, somebody that probably had played at the academy, had done some coaching, had been at the academy. It was an active duty officer who had been at the academy for a few years, perhaps as an assistant coach, and then had gone off and done a few years on, on another tour, and then was brought back. Eventually, they would have been brought back as coach of the football team. They were reasonably knowledgeable, I guess, okay, but essentially amateurs. They were not professional coaches. Okay, they, you know, they didn't spend their lives coaching, analyzing coaching, analyzing how to get the most out of their people and what people they needed, okay? It was an amateur system. And what Eichelberger says is, if we're going to get good, we can't have an amateur system, okay? We need a real coach, okay? A professional coach, a person that that is all he does as, is coach. Okay, now this was a hard sell because there were a, a number of people higher up at the academy, people had been at the academy for a long time, didn't want to break it. One thing that you got to know about Army tradition, about West Point tradition, and I'm sure Navy tradition as well, is it doesn't change real fast, okay? Uh, you know, it's not something, you know, the word radical, the, the word radical change is not a, a, a phrase that the academy really likes, you know. The academy way of changing this thing is, 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 is let's, okay, there's an idea. Let's think about this idea for a while. Then let's shelve it for a few years. And then let's bring it back out and let's think about it for a while. And then maybe a decade later, let's, you know, let's, Let's move a little bit in that direction, okay? Slowly change. But Eichelberger says, look, we've got to change. And one of, the, one of Eichelberger's great fears is the academy had developed a tradition that Eichelberger was, uh, uh, was fearful for the future of the academy, okay? Uh, the academy was seen as out of date. You know, that they had the school solution. Everybody knew the school solution, okay? But, but you know, when you would see the academy pictured in the New York Times or in Life magazine, it would always be, you know, you would see academy uh, uh, cadets riding horses, okay? Jumping over obstacles. This is an age of tanks. But these guys were still learning to ride like they were going to be cavalry officers uh, in, in the Civil War. Or they would always show, the New York Times, uh, Life Magazine loved to show academy of, uh, cadets escorting good-looking females at one cotillion or another, okay? So they had the white gloves and the tarbuckle helmet and, and you know, they looked great marching. But suddenly we have a chief of staff, an army chief of staff, that is not an academy graduate. George Marshall from VMI. He's not really wild about the academy. He doesn't think the academy is a good investment in government money. 
He's really a supporter, and he's a product of, a ROTC program. He feels ROTC programs can, can support the government and, and the Army better than West Point. So one of the things Eichelberg is always concerned with is, you know, there are people in Washington, D.C. that really don't agree with the Academy, that thinks that maybe the Academy is, 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 has passed its prime. Is, is not the right way to go. And one of these people is George Catlin Marshall himself. So you know, what are we going to do? One of the things that he wants, to, he wants to make a number of changes at the academy, not just with the football team, but the way academy does things and the way they're training officers as well. And I'm not going to get into that. But one of the things he wants to do is bring in a professional coach. And the professional coach he wants to bring in, an academy graduate himself, is a guy by the name of Red Blake. Earl Red Blake, who had been coaching at Dartmouth. Now, the Ivy League was really good back in the 20s and the 30s, so yeah, don't say, ah, Ivy League, come on, that's not a professional coach. In point of fact, national championships were won by Ivy League schools. You know, in 1940, one of the best schools in the country, in 1939, one of the best schools in the country was Cornell. And actually in 40, uh, Blake, Blake's uh, a Dartmouth team defeated Cornell. So, he wants to bring in Blake. Blake's it's good, okay. Talks to Blake. One of the first letters, you know, and it's, it's in, in the archives at, at West Point, one of the first letters that Eichelberger writes is to Blake. And he says, you know, the Army-Navy game's coming up. Let's get together and talk, okay. You know, your academy needs you, okay. You, you, you might want to do something. So they get together and talk. And one of the things that, that Blake is concerned with is, I'm not sure I can win at the academy. Okay. One of the, his main concerns is the academy had strict height, weight requirements. Now, these requirements were put in place by the Surgeon General, but there were people who felt that the height, weight requirements for the academy really represented the, a look that the Army wanted to cultivate, kind of a thin cadet, okay, because they looked good in the straight lines, you know, out on the plane, okay? And so, for example, if you were six foot, uh, the, the heaviest you could be at six foot was 176 pounds. You had to be between 160 and 176 pounds if you were six foot. If you were six foot four, which is the tallest you could be at the academy, the heaviest you could be was 198 pounds at six foot four. You know, look good. Look good marching in a line, you know, fabulous. And I'm, I'm sure that we have a number of, uh, we have a few cadets in here that know that when they, when they went into a company at the beginning of their career, they went into a company based on height. Okay, it's, it's the way they separated them, how it was going to look on the, on the plane when they marched. Anyway, Blake said, you can't win like this. You can't win like this. So, Eichelberger went to work. He had people in FDRs, uh, very close to FDR and in the administration, and he was able to get these height weight requirements changed. Okay, so what I'm saying about changing something is it takes effort, and you have to get a lot of people on board. It's not just him making a decision. It's got to be you know, the Army on board. It's got to be the people close to Roosevelt. You've got to make changes. Okay, so with this change, Blake decides to come, and I should say a word about Blake. Blake was obsessive, okay? He, all he thought about was football, okay? Morning, noon, and night. That's all he cared about. Uh, he, be, he is the prototype for the modern obsessive coach. Film, film, film. He, he pioneers the use of film in football. Okay, it, it, it's all he did. <laughs> How obsessive was he? He had a, he had a son, Robert, who was a very good quarterback and will end, end up he'll play at West Point too, though there's problems I won't get into. But anyway, Robert played at, at Highland Falls, played for a local high school team. In Robert Bob's entire high school career, his dad saw him play exactly one half of one quarter, okay? About six minutes of football. That's all. Why? He was working all the rest of the time. He couldn't, you know, he, in, in the middle of the night, 
he would wake up an assistant coach. He'd call on the phone and say, let's go down and, and, and watch some film. Are you ready to go? And the assistant coach says, yeah, I'm ready to go. Okay, this is the guy he is. He is obsessed. Uh, there was one great story that was told by one of his assistant coaches, a guy who went on to a coaching career of his own, uh, a guy by the name of Vince Lombardi that maybe some of you have heard about, um, who was a lot like Blake. You want to know how Lombardi became Lombardi? Look at Blake. Um, but anyway, they were watching films and it, one summer, and it, hour after hour after hour. And his coaches, the two coaches that were with him, were getting tired. And Blake must have seen it. And he said, hey, you guys want to have some fun? And they said, yeah. And they're thinking, let's go play golf or something like that. And Blake turns around to the projectionist and he says, break out some of those old Army-Navy films. Let's watch those for a while. You know, his idea of having fu fun was watching more films. Okay, so they get a professional coach. Okay, so we're on our way. They were on their way. But the problem is, Blake has his first season, 1941, remarkable improvement. I mean, the team still loses to Army, Navy, and Penn, which are the three big games, um, or you have trouble with them. Um, but they have a good season in 41. But then, at the end of 41, America goes to war. The question is, what happens to sports? What happens to, to our, our peacetime activities during war? You know, football players, what do they represent? They are the biggest, the strongest, the most rugged, the most robust Americans. You know, should they be on a football field? in World War II when a nation's at war, or should they be in uniform? I mean, there's a real question whether football was going to survive during the war, whether any sports were going to survive. Some of you are familiar with baseball during World War II. It just barely survived. It took a decision by Franklin Roosevelt to say, yes, baseball will continue, but it continued at a, at a, at a reduced level of excellence, to say the least. Okay, what is going to happen to football? The most masculine of all sports, boxing and football. The Army's ready to waylay, you know, to, to can football. Uh, the Marshall, Marshall and, I, and I had this letter, it's another letter that I find, I uh, used it in the book. Marshall actually wrote a letter to the new superintendent, Eichelberger got another assignment, went overseas as part of MacArthur's staff, and a new superintendent, a guy by the name of Wilby, came in. And Marshall actually wrote a letter to Wilby saying, in 1942, saying, you know, we're, we're going to discontinue football. Okay, we're going to cancel the 1943 season. Football's over. Other schools are thinking the same thing. Okay, football is almost going to die. Okay, but football survives. And the reason football survives is if, if you want to thank anybody for the Army victory over Navy in 1944, who are the Navy people in here? Okay, we've got a few Navy people in here. Thank the United States Navy, okay? Because they're the ones that cared the most about football, okay? There was a great debate in the Navy over what's going to happen to football. And it really revolves around Navy training programs. You know, we, we need our universities, we need our colleges, we need to continue to train officers. Now, the question is, will those officers be able to play varsity sports while they train for war, okay? The head of physical fitness for the United States Navy was this guy. Does anybody recognize this guy up here? Huh? Would it help if I said he was a former heavyweight champion of the world? No. Close. No, not Dempsey. Beat Dempsey. Gene Tunney. Okay, Gene Tunney. Here's Gene Tunney and his wife. Gene Tunney was made, he was a Marine, the fighting Marine, that's what they called him. Gene Tunney was 
the head of physical fitness. Gene Tunney, you would think, oh, he's a Marine. I mean, he's a, he's a former heavyweight champion. He, he made millions of dollars fighting, and he did make millions of dollars, and he made even more by a really advantageous marriage. Um, that, yeah, which boxing he wouldn't, let's face it, I mean, he was not going to meet uh, his daughter, uh, the relation of Vanderbilt. Uh, it wasn't going to happen without uh, a whole lot of money. Anyway, who's opposed to it? Uh, let, let me give you, a, uh, read a quote from Tunney in here, if I can find it. Okay, uh, Tunney said, you can't train a man to be a fighter by having him play football or baseball. College football is nothing more than athletic boondoggling, okay? It has no place in war or, in war or preparing for war. As far as Tunney is concerned, in the Navy programs, no football, no football. Now, opposed to Tunney, Murray, former, former football coach at the United States Naval Academy, is a, is a guy by the name of, um, I can't believe I forgot it here, is, is a guy by the name of Thomas Hamilton. Okay, Thomas Hamilton. Thomas Hamilton loved football. Thomas Hamilton believed there was no better way to train officers than to have them play football. It was the best, it was teamwork, it was aggressive, it was tough, it trained, it helped to train exactly the kind of officer you wanted, okay? He will write, in 1942, he will say, football, Navy, war. At this time in history, at no time in history, have these words been more entwined and intermeshed than they are now. Okay, 1942, he is saying in our programs, and the first program that the Navy starts is something, and, and some of you maybe remember it. You know, these are some things I didn't really know when I started it, but it was a program called the V V5 program, V5 program, and it was designed to train naval air officers, okay? In this, and it was at a limited number of schools, only five schools initially, the V5 programs, Hamilton said, let's allow our, in, our cadets in the V5 programs to play varsity football, okay? If they want to play varsity sports, let's allow them, and they do. The next year, it comes up because America is really gearing up for the war now. And in uh, 1943, it comes up again. The Army, in 1943, instituted what was called the Army Specialized Training Program, ASTP. Okay? In the Army Specialized Training Program, varsity sport, uh, the cadets, it was a lean, mean program. Cadets couldn't play varsity sports. Okay? The Navy will institute a program called the V-12 program, okay, V-12 program to train Navy officers, Marine officers. These programs allowed varsity sports to continue and allowed V-12 cadets to play in varsity football games, okay. Without the V-12 program, and these were immense programs at hundreds of schools, without the V-12 program, there probably wouldn't have been college football in World War II. Uh, for example, and I think I have the number here, um, there were, of the Army programs, the ASTP programs, in 241 schools. In the V-12 programs, 131 schools. So what's going to happen is this. Schools with Army training programs, most of them discontinued football, okay? There's not enough people to play. They can't be competitive. So a lot of schools, some of them very good schools, just for a year or two years discontinued football. For example, what was the best school? What's the best school? Who won the national championship last year? Huh? Alabama discontinued its program. It had an army program. So if you had an army program, sorry, you're out of luck. If you had a navy program, you were in high cotton, okay? You were walking in high cotton if you had a navy program. You played and you won. And if you had a navy V-12 marine program, you know, some of the more aggressive of the, of, of the cadets, then you had a good chance of, of, of competing for a national title. 
Who do you think in, had the, one of the largest, actually second largest, V-12 Marine program in the country? Huh? Not Missouri. If Missouri had the largest, I'm, I'm thinking of the second. Notre Dame. Is this surprise anybody in here? And surprise, surprise, Notre Dame wins the national championship in 1943. And you did say Purdue, and Purdue had a very good one too. And in 1943, Purdue went undefeated, okay? I don't know about Penn State. I don't know, but Purdue went undefeated. And the way these programs, these were wonderful programs, the way they worked, is um, you had a program. So let's say you were a football player of some repute, maybe an All-American at Illinois. And Illinois didn't have one of these programs. Well, you got in one of the programs at Notre Dame or at Purdue or at another school, okay? So what you start seeing are athletes just changing schools, okay? Willy-nilly, there are no uh, rules about switching or eligibility rules. Or, and in fact, if you were going to enroll in a V-12 program, you could actually start playing on the football team before you were actually even in the school. And sometimes, since these things ran six months, they would finish before the season was over, and you may be sent to another V-12 program at another school. So you would have players, let's say, that played you know, most of the season until November, at the end of October for, for Purdue, and then they'd end up playing a school that played against Purdue, okay, by the end of the season. So, yes, Drew Brees, uh, he was not involved in the program, but he would have been. Okay, but, so what I'm saying, it's a really crazy system. Now, the advantages for the military academies is that once you were in a military academy, you were there for the duration, as long as you passed, okay? And uh, in the military academy in World War II was for three years. It had shortened its four years to three years because of the military to turn soldiers out a little bit faster, officers out a little bit faster. But you were there for three years. Now, if you're in a V-12 program, you could be gone. And, and quite frankly, you know, by the end of 1942, you know, when we start landing on the beach, Marines on the beaches of Tarawa and other places, you know, suddenly those programs started to fall apart as, as, as the V-12 candidates were called into active duty. Okay, so Army had and Navy had a natural advantage at this time, okay? And they will use their advantage to really recruit players, okay? Uh, you know, they, 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 they've got to bring in the best players, and this is a great time to recruit players. And the key recruiter... This is Wilby, who becomes the superintendent. I mentioned him. The key recruiter for Army is going to be, I loved writing this book. And my, maybe my favorite character in the whole book that I wrote about is this guy, a guy by the name of Herman Hickman, who was built along the lines of kind of a steel football, a, a, a steel football okay? Um, big guy, 300 pounds, all-American, football player at, at, at Tennessee, great football player, a professional wrestler, uh, you know, a guy who was a great orator, he was a charmer, he was a talker, he was, he was literate, he loved English literature. Uh, let me read you just a, 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 a little f part about uh, uh, Hickman. Let me see if I can find it here. Okay, and this is, a, this is a story that was told by Grantland Rice, okay, in 1946, after the great army teams at the end. Grantland Rice was talking about the fall, next year, and he says, well, what's it going to be like, Herman? Well, you know, what's going to happen? And, uh, and, and, and Herman said, Granny, the best way I can put it is, is this. And he started to quote poetry, okay, a poem, and he, he had memorized thousands and thousands of poems. I mean, the guy was great. And he started to talk, and he started to quote a poem, and he ended, and, he, and, and, and the end of the poem was, though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not 
now the strength of those day of those old days no excuse me we, we are not now that strength which in old days moved heaven and earth that which we are we are one equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate but strong in will to strive to seek to find and not to yield and you know it's uh, Grantland Rice later wrote, as he said, who, how many people, how many people, off the cuff, you asked a question, okay, could answer it perfectly and, and involve, enfold into their answer the last 16 lines of Tennyson's Ulysses, okay? I mean, that's the kind of guy he was. And if you want somebody to recruit, this is the recruiter. And the place he goes to recruit is in the South. Okay, how do you build a great team? Everybody's got to be on board. You do it consciously, okay? Everything has to be done. And he starts to recruit players. Just wanna, I'm just going to mention a few of the players because I love these guys. One of my favorite, and you can see his smile, um, Barney Pohl. Barney Pohl, an end. Of course, back in those days, you played both ways, offense and defense. Barney came from Gloucester, Mississippi. He was the ninth of nine children. Barney said in an interview, he said, you know, uh, his father died shortly after he was born. He said, if my father hadn't died, we may have had a big family. <laughs> okay. Gives you an idea of Barney. Barney played two years at Old Miss. Then Barney got himself in a V12 program and played a year for Duke. And then Hickman said, Barney, you really need to train to be an officer. So Barney went to West Point, and he'll play three years at West Point. <laughs> but he wasn't the best student of the group, okay? And Barney will flunk out of West Point, which is okay for Barney. He goes back, he plays his last two years at Old Miss, okay? So Barney played like seven years of college football, okay? <laughs> now, one of the things with West Point is, you know, you could play someplace else and then go to West Point and play, uh, uh, you know, a full and, and, you, and you could do it at, at Annapolis, too. You could go and play another career. You know, the great Purdue player, Barney Olfant, uh, not Barney, Elmer Olfant did the same thing. So this is, this is Barney Pohl. He's going to be an All-American in, uh, you know, in his plebe year. Well, his plebe year, he was about 90. Uh, and he, no, he wasn't. I mean, but, you know, the guy's 22 already, okay? So he's a, another guy that I love who was not the best student in the world and actually won't make it through the academy is DeWitt Tex Colder. Okay, DeWitt grew up in uh, an orphanage in, uh, in Texas. And DeWitt was, if there was a picture in a dictionary beside mean, okay, it would be DeWitt Tex Colder. He was mean, okay. Uh, he had a way of hitting that was developed at this, uh, at, at the school, the, the orphanage he went to in Fort Worth, okay, um, and the Masonic Orphanage it was, and it was a, it was developed by a, a, a guy by the name of Brown, um, and it was a way of coming up and using your shoulder almost like a punch and throwing it, I almost hurt myself there, and throwing it into a, a faceless, you know, there's no face mask at this time, into an opposing player, and he was expert at it. He and his teammate at, at, at the Masonic Academy, a guy by the name of Hardy Brown, these guys terrorized Texas football. Now, you're saying they're high school players. How many times have you had, yeah, yeah, wink, wink, high school players, really big hitters. Okay, now, I, I, I understand what you're thinking. You're not buying what I'm saying. Let me say this, however. In the late 1950s, there was a, 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 a uh, an article written about the hardest hitters in the NFL, okay? And they listed about four or five, six of them. Two of them were DeWitt Colder, Colder and Hardy Brown, okay? So these guys are both going to have 
exceptional uh, 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 knockout, knocking other people out, uh, professional careers as well. Uh, and, you know, the problem with DeWitt was the whistle that stopped plays. DeWitt interpreted a whistle as, well, finish what you're doing, okay? <laughs> that a whistle was more of a, a suggestion. Okay, uh, it, it was nothing definitive about a whistle. You know, sort of finishing up or what you were maybe thinking of doing, okay? Uh, so he drew lots of penalties, and uh, hitting after the whistle was his big problem. Blake, in practices, and they used to have ferocious practices. Blake had two great teams on that squad. Uh, Blake said to the other players, look, when the whistle blows, if you're anywhere around DeWitt, hit the ground, because he will nail you. I mean, it didn't matter if it was an opposing player or as a, a teammate. He was going to hit you. Okay, so, you know, here we have D. Witt Clinton, also is going to be an American, an, uh, an All-American in 1944. As a matter of fact, you know, players played both ways. So on an All-American team, there were only 11 first-team All-Americans, not like today where you had offense and defense. 11 first-team All-Americans, okay? Of the 11 first-team All-Americans in 1944, seven of them will play for either Army or Navy. Okay, so you can imagine this game in 1944. Can you imagine a game today where you would have 14 of the 22 All-Americans on, on the field at the same time? You know, maybe LSU, Alabama, I don't know. I'd have to count them up, but, you know, it's, it's a lot. Okay, uh, then we had, in the backfield, Mr. Inside, Mr. Outside, it's hard uh, to exaggerate the importance of these two players. At number 35, uh, Felix Doc Blanchard. And number 41, uh, Glenn Davis. Blanchard had played, at, had started his career at, um, at North Carolina, and then he had gone into the military, and he was pulled out of the military army and sent to West Point, uh, enrolled in West Point. And he was a bruiser. This was Mr. Inside. He will be a Heisman Trophy winner, as will Davis win a Heisman Trophy. Blanchard will win the Heisman Trophy the next year in uh, 45. How can I describe Blanchard? When Notre Dame scouted Blanchard, Notre Dame coach saw Blanchard played and then wired back to the other coaches at Notre Dame. And he said, I've just seen Superman in the flesh. He wears number 35, and he goes by the name of Felix Doc Blanchard. Okay, so this is a guy that, I mean, he was big. He was rugged. Uh, he, he may have been better on defense than offense. I mean, he, he, just, he just would come at people with, high, with his knees churning high and just run people over. Okay, I mean, he was as, as, as good as you're going to get. Davis... Davis was one of the few people that had gone straight to the academy from high school. Okay? And, and I might say this. Oftentimes, people didn't go straight to the academy from high school. You know, not only players, but sometimes they would go to another school to prep. And I mean, it, the academy was hard to get in, and the academy was very demanding. And the number that went straight from high school, they usually went through some sort of prep program, many of them. Uh, Davis didn't, and Davis struggled at the academy academically, though he will graduate. He will bust out, he'll flunk out his uh, plebe year, and so he had to go back and repeat his, repeat his plebe year. Um, but he was, a, you, you can kind of see it a little bit, he was almost like a choir boy. He was small, I mean, compared to these other guys. But Davis was just so fast and so athletically gifted. He could play any sport. He was a great baseball player. He ran for the track team. Uh, he could play basketball. I mean, he was just this gifted athlete. Uh, Blake said that Davis was, was like, you know, was in the Ty Cobb range of athletes. I mean, he was that good. Um, Bill Yeoman. Has anybody ever heard the name Bill Yeoman in here before? Bill Yeoman was a coach. He coached at the University of Houston, and he was an academy graduate. And, and he was there with, uh, with Blanchard and, uh, and, 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 and Davis. And, and Bill Yeoman one time said, he said, you know, there are words to describe how great Doc Blanchard was. 
really no words to describe how great Davis was. You know, that he was just that gifted of an athlete. I mean, I watched some of the films, and it, 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 there's a great run that he makes against Navy. And, and he has, he's running down the sidelines, and two Navy guys have perfect angles on him to make the tackle. One of them is a guy by the name of Smackover Scott. I love that nickname, Smackover. He's from Smackover, Arkansas. And Smackover Scott was an Olympic runner, okay? I mean, so this is a guy who finished second in the, in the high hurdles in the Olympics. So he is a really fast guy. And he has a perfect angle. And Smackover Scott could outrun anybody. But when he gets to the sidelines, you know, Davis is two feet in front of him. And it's gone. I mean, it was like one person, the quarterback of this team, said uh, Doug Cannon, who I talked to a great deal, was a wonderful guy. Doug Cannon said, you know, he had, he, he just had, he had gears that nobody else really had. Okay, and you, you just could. So here is the team. It's 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 a spectacular team. Um, 1944. All the pieces are in place, and it's ready. It's ready to roll. You know, 1942, 41, 42, 43, you know, Navy is beating Army. Navy is beating Army. Navy is beating Army. Notre Dame beating Army, beating Army, beating Army. But 44, Army is ready. And Army runs through its early season, which it often did. But this time, it's running through teams winning like 85 to nothing, 70-something to nothing. You know, there are games that are such blow-off outs that, that the coaches agree to let's shorten, you know, let's only play in the second half instead of, you know, 15 minutes, let's play seven-minute halves, what have you. Let's cut down the, the game. You know, let's, let's hold the score down as much as possible. Blake, there are times where Blake tells his team, nobody else can score. There's one great story I loved where uh, this guy, he, he had his worst players in, okay, his fourth team. And this one fourth team player had never been in game, intercepted. Blake had said, don't score. And this guy intercepts the ball, and he's running for a touchdown. And uh, Kenneth said that about the 10-yard line, he start, you could see him sort of slow down like he was remembering what Blake said. And, he, eh, and finally he gets down to the one-yard line, and he, and he puts the ball down on the one-yard line rather than score. And so they didn't know what to do, so Blake said, okay, make him kick a field goal. So in first down, they went for a field goal, and the guy missed the field goal, okay, and so they didn't score. But this, I mean, they are destroying teams. Okay, and they get to the end of the season, and they've got the two big games coming up. Okay, and the big games are the Notre Dame game and the Navy game, okay? And, you know, for a decade, for a decade, Notre Dame had beaten Army like a rented mule, okay? I mean, just, just pulverized them. Okay? Army couldn't even score against Notre Dame. This game... It's played November, November 11th, Armistice Day, 1944. I mean, New York City, Yankee Stadium. The Americans, this is what America was about. This, I mean, people are crazy for this game. Um, you know, before the game, they had a, 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 there was a, a ceremony at, at Herald Square celebrating our, at you know, 11 o'clock Armistice Day, Armistice Day. Okay, and uh, people went to that. At noon, at Times Square, it's not like it's moving uptown. There's a raffle um, for and, 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 uh, a rally, and they hold a raffle. They raffle off two tickets to the game. And I uh, found a wonderful story in the New York Times, and there was a Navy guy that really wanted to go to the game in the worst sort of way. And the bidding starts, and it goes to like, you know, $50 and he's there and $100 and he's there. He's got like $120 or $130 and it goes past it and he, he can't get the tickets. And I think the tickets went, two tickets went for $5,000. It's a lot of money at that time. Some woman from Boston bought them for $5,000. She paid for the tickets, bought the tickets and gave them to the Navy guy. Is that a nice, is that a sweet story? I love that story. Uh, you know, they go, uh, you know, at the game, there's going to be, you know, one of the guys that was there, this is, if, if you want Army lore, this is Russell Red Reader, um, who had recently lost part of his leg fighting in the Bocage country 
of uh, France right after D-Day. And Reeder had come back for the game, and he's on the sidelines with his, you know, in a, in a, in a wheelchair with a white blanket covering his, his missing leg. Uh, and, you know, so, I mean, there's a lot of drama in this game, um, a lot of drama before the game. Once the game starts, there's less drama. Uh, the Navy Army gets a great deal of revenge in this game, and they win this game by a score of, I think it's 48 to nothing. Someplace in here I probably have the score. It's 48 to nothing. Okay, so it is a big win for Army. Okay, and which brings us to our last game, and I'm sure I'm running out of time here, and, I, and, 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 and please excuse me, but the last game is, and this is the program, from the December 2nd, 1944 Army-Navy game. Um, and it's, uh, you know, kind of the climax of the book. The book's not about this game. It's, a, it, it's about a war story. Uh, and in and, and this game, I like to see this game as, as a game that was played by boys who were training to be soldiers and sailors. And it will be listened to by hard-bitten soldiers and sailors really wishing they were boys once again. This game is broadcast across the world on Armed Forces Radio. I mean, people are listening to this game in Belgium, you know, just weeks before the Battle of the Bulge. I've got a great picture in the book in St. Vith, which will be a, a key junction in the Battle of the Bulge and the people following the games, the army officers. It's listened on, on the island of Leyte in the Philippines where we were fighting in the Philippines. It's, it's, you know, in North Africa, in the Pacific, the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, you know, everybody tunes into this game for a few hours, for a few hours, the war is going to stop. You know, the brasses, marshal, king of the Navy, you are at this game. I mean, this is the game. Um, the previous two years, Army and Navy had been a small affair because of rationing, gas rationing, rubber rationing. Uh, in 42, the game was played at Annapolis, and nobody outside of a 10-mile area uh, could go to the game. So it's like a high school game. Same thing. In 43, it's played at West Point. Nobody in 10 miles. The Corps and the midshipmen couldn't go. And so as a matter of fact, when it was at, 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 at Annapolis, half the midshipmen sat on Army side and learned Army cheers and cheered, for, you know, had to pretend like they were cheering. And same thing at West Point. Half the, half the Corps had to learn the Navy cheers. And yeah, go Mike, you know, and all that stuff, the GOAT. Um, anyway, so now, and it was supposed to go back to Annapolis, but it was too big of a game. And, you know, the government, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Then somebody said, we can raise money. Let's sell war bonds, okay? Let's hold the game in Baltimore, and we'll sell war bonds. We'll raise a lot of money. Uh, you know, as, <laughs> when they were announcing it, the Secretary of Treasury, um, uh, a guy by the name of Henry Morgenthau, he's announcing, he says, yeah, we can make a lot of money. And, and the reporter said, well, how much? And Morgenthau said, well, you know, maybe about five or $10 million. And, and one of his aides said, oh, excuse me, Mr. Secretary, but it's more like $50 million. And he said, oh, 50 million? Well, that's a lot more money then. Uh, it will raise $58 million, you know. To go to the game, you had to buy a war bond. Series E, I think, war bond. You know, this is an age where we paid for wars while we were going, you know, the, the populace paid for wars. It, it's changed, it's changed, and I won't go into that. But, yeah. It is the cold, bitter cold. One of my favorite characters in this, the, 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 the first captain uh, of West Point, you know, top cadet, was a guy by the name of Robert Woods, started at Navy, played against, uh, against Army for Navy. After two years, he flunked out and he went to Army. And he played for Army against Navy. So here's a guy that actually played on both sides. It was really interesting because he could talk about how both sides approached the game. Anyway, make a long story short, you know, this is the time I'm talking about. This is the, the movie that you saw. This is the, you know, the whole, oh, when is the war going to be over? After D-Day, we thought we were going to win it. And remember, this whole season is taking place between D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, you know, but this is the game that America tunes into, okay? This is 
number one ranked team in the nation versus number two ranked team in the nation. Seven of the 11 first team All-Americans. By far the best two teams. And this is, I don't want to say this is what we are fighting for, okay? But in a sense, this is what we were fighting for. You know, six million men in uniform, they were citizen soldiers. They just wanted to get the job done and get home. And for a few hours, they could listen to what they wanted to get home to. Football on a crisp fall, brutally cold winter day. Okay, be that as it may, I got carried away. But this is what they wanted. Army wins. Let me finish by reading you a telegram that Blake received the day after the game. Urgent, 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 urgent. The greatest of all Army teams, stop. We have stopped the war to celebrate your magnificent success. It was signed, MacArthur, the greatest of all Army fans. That's the story I have to tell. I think I've run out of time, but I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much.